So, uh, welcome everybody. Actually, I think I have way more slides that uh, I may be able to go through, but I hope to be able to give you an overview of, uh, of data visualization, what is its uh, challenges and its limitation. My name is uh, Rita Borgo. Most of my research has been focused in, on the area of data visualization, and in particular for really large and complex data sets. So let's start. The first thing is, I would like to start with an, with an example to um, introduce you on what is visualization and what is, why it is important. Uh, you may have heard uh, a lot about, uh, a lot and often, uh, the term insight. So uh, we have our data, we have our data sets, uh, and what we use visualization for it is just to be able to gain more insight more quickly and more effectively into our data. This is just a data set uh, in a tabular form. We all are familiar with uh, data distributed in tabular form, and in particular in this example, it's from, uh, um, it is from uh, a data set back in the, in the 50s, and it was uh, um, aimed at looking at the effectiveness of, of antibiotics against a certain type of, um, of, uh, um, uh, of strain of, uh, of bacteria. Now, um, the, the organization of the, of, the, of the data is quite straightforward. Okay. Why is not advancing? On the left, we have just uh, all the type of bacteria, then have the type of the antibiotic, uh, antibiotics, then we have a classification which is normally used in, uh, in biology, and it just uh, classifies a different type of, uh, of uh, um, of, uh, um, of, uh, uh, of, of, of bacteria by a certain property, and this is normally binary, it's like they are either negative or positive. And then we actually have the, um, sorry, it doesn't seem to be advancing properly. I'm just using the keyboard. Yeah, okay, now again, we got stuck. And then um, in, the, in, in the center, just the, the the concentration that is needed to be able to, um, in a, to, um, to uh, for the antibiotic to act uh, against the bacteria. So, um, if we look at the, at the data, then we know that the smaller the concentration, uh, the better it is, because this, is, this tells us that uh, the minim this is the minimum amount of concentration that uh, allows for a specific type of antibiotic to be effective against a specific type of, uh, a, a specific type of bacteria. So, normally, the, 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 the less, the better. So, uh, how many questions can we ask? Well, we can ask really quite a, uh, quite a, a wide range of questions uh, when we want to inspect the type of data sets. But, uh, and particularly, uh, Jacques Bertin in uh, 1950, looked at this data to understand, uh, as to, ask a to answer a, spe a specific type of question, which is how effective are the, dra are the drugs? So, what he did uh, it was to plot everything on a very clever uh, um, visual display. He, uh, first of all, he started from the fact that the lower the concentration, the better it was, because there was less medicine to be, to, be pro to be given to the patients. So the first thing he did was to consider the, to uh, reverse the scale. So the, the zero was at the top, while the maximum number was at the bottom. If you, know, if you, can, if you can, probably it's not, it's not that as visible on the, on the projector, maybe in the, I hope in the, in the zoom one, the zoom talk is a bit more, more is, is a bit neater the image. So at the bottom we have uh, 0.001 and at the bottom we have 100. So it literally flipped the, flipped the, the axis the way he was doing, he was listening the axis. This allowed him, this allowed him to be able to use a bar chart and uh, use the, the length of the bar chart to convey the powerfulness of a specific antibiotics. So this was, was this, his first trick. Then the second one, was to just uh, um, organize everything along a radial axis, which allowed him to create this nice split uh, based on the type of stain. And then he just grouped the bacteria by the different families, and he, ca he kind of started uh, uh, analyzing and understanding what was the effectiveness of each, uh, of each antibiotics for each bacteria. So um, uh, one of the, one of the, the things that he, he we can quickly kind of grasp is that, for example, everything that is uh, penicillin-based penicillin is good from, for gram-positive uh, uh, bacteria, uh, and is definitely better than, uh, than neomycin, and so on. Um, okay. 
So, um, the, um, the, um, the visualization was, was quite effective to understand the different, the, the different powerful and the different effect of the different type of antibiotics. And this was because one of the, 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 the strength of, the, of, the, of changing the encoding from numerical to visual was that uh, we were really leveraging what is one of the most powerful communication channels, which is our visual channels. So, um, however, uh, one of the things that which, uh, which is interesting to, to look at is the fact that uh, uh, to be able to, to visualize data, there is not just one, univo one unique mean. We can use different, <coughs> different mean, uh, both in terms of how we encode the values and the, the attributes in our data, as well as how we organize them in, uh, from a display point of view, how we organize them in space. So for example, this particular data set could have been also uh, organized not on a radial chart, but on a simple linear chart. Um, there is one more thing, one extra thing which is interesting, and this is that uh, if we start looking at um, uh, the data organized in a different way, then the type of questions that we may want to ask may, may differ. The kind of the new question may emerge. This is a, a different way of organizing the, sa the exact same data, but by uh, resistance to, um, to, to, to specific type of drugs, and uh, clustering each, uh, uh, and single, each single, um, each single uh, um, element by its family, its bacteria family. So uh, looking at uh, this, particular, this, this particular grouping, there are a couple of, uh, of, uh, of um, things that, uh, that should pop, should pop up, pop up uh, from, the, from the, the new organization. So if we think that the first, uh, the first one, the first uh, um, graph at the top shows us the resistance to uh, penicillin, streptomycin, neomycin, this is just resistance to penicillin and streptomycin, and so on. And then we look at how the, uh, the, 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 the behavior of each single bacterial um, is, uh, is being displayed. There are a couple of things that should pop out. And the first one, the, the first one is that there are two, um, two bacteria that seem to be uh, appearing in clusters which are not necessarily the cluster uh, where their family is, prevalent, is prevalently present. And these are these two bacteria. So the first one is the Streptococcus fecalis, and the second one is Di Diprococcus pneumoniae. So those two things, they should not be appearing there, because the Streptococcus should actually be appearing underneath with the other Streptococcus. And the Diprococcus, because it's, it's, it's a different one, should, should, could, or could be here or could be somewhere else. But it's definitely not a Streptococcus, not, not belonging to the same family. Well, what, what, the, what they found out uh, uh, by uh, doing some a bit more research and not just through this visualization was that those two bacteria had been classified uh, uh, wrongly. They, uh, the first one was not a streptococcus at all, and the second one, the diplococcus, was actually a streptococcus. So it took 30 years to find out the first mistake and about 20 years to realize the second. If uh, um, if the, uh, w w we could say that with a different type of visualization, perhaps this error would have been more, uh, more evident and easier, to, easier to, uh, to spot. However, at that time, this was not the type of analysis that they were looking for. Therefore, this was not something that, uh, that came up straight away. So uh, the same thing is if the, uh, the same data are uh, plotted using a different uh, layout, which is uh, just a simple, a, um, a simple scatter plot. Again, we see that there are a couple of, uh, of, uh, of um, actors, of, 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 uh, of uh, people appearing in places where they shouldn't be. So this one should appear in this cluster, and this probably should not appear with this cluster, but somewhere else. So um, this is just to show that the type of, of uh, the, the visualization is not just only something that I mean that can help us uh, look at insight in data. So just look for something that we already either we want to look for or or we would like to validate. But sometimes it also shows us something that was une that is unexpected, something that about the data that can be a bug, can be an error, or can just be a signal that we didn't really know was there. 
And this is one of the, 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 the um, main uh, funding that uh, great, uh, one, of the, one of the great uh, um, founder of uh, exploratory data analysis, uh, analysis uh, um, supported, which is that the greatest value of a picture is when it forces us to notice what we never expected to see. And this is from, from jo uh, John Taki, which uh, for those who knew was, uh, was a really great statistician. So uh, this is really what visualization is, uh, why visualization is interesting and why it is important. Not only to validate or to gain uh, or to, to, to answer questions that we already have, but also to, to support the exploration and bring new questions and bring to the surface and let emerge, emerge information that may not be so obviously there. Saying that, uh, there are usually two main uh, goals of visualization. The first one is exploration, as I mentioned before, and the other one can, is uh, ex explanations. So in the first case, we have analysis of data. The second case, we have communication. What's the main difference? Well, communication is interesting because we don't really need to be there to communicate something. So if you think, for example, infographics or, or a video, they don't necessarily need the person to be there to explain. The, the visualization should, can, who then should stand uh, on its own. When we talk about analysis, then it's much more a case of human interaction and, uh, and uh, teamwork or, or individual scientific work. But no matter the, no matter the goal, the main uh, objective is that for visualization and what it, any type of visual representation to actually be effective. Now, uh, how do we define effectiveness? Effectiveness can be defined by several principles, and probably you will hear more than the ones that I am going to, 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 to go through today. But there are a few, there are a bunch that are kind of valid across uh, different, uh, different uh, school of thoughts and different domains. And uh, the main one that I would like to, to, to go through today are, the first one is graphical integrity, simplicity, the carefulness in using the type of displays and the type of encoding. Now, when we talk about graphical inte integrity, uh, we refer to how accurately we pre represent visual elements, so how ac accurately we represent our data. Uh, many presentations uh, always start talking about uh, a visualization that mislead, that, uh, that uh, um, Say, say, present data or present a message that is not truthful. You probably have encountered this. This is one of the most uh, famous, most used examples. This is a uh, Fox News, uh, uh, Fox News chart. Unfortunately, there are several uh, newspapers and, and video channels and TV channels that I'm not going to mention. Not only Fox News that try tend to. They, they like to tweak with the, with the way they are presented just to convey a very specific message. So this is part of our everyday life. So um, Fox News is particularly bad at this. This is why it always features so often. But this, I want to use this example because it's one of the, it's, it's, quite, it's quite striking, but it's also one of the most used. So the issue in here is that uh, the bar chart is dis displayed in a way that this difference between the two, the two extremes appears to be really, really, really high. Um, so, uh, what is interesting in here, and this is one of the points of contention, is that uh, uh, what happens is the bar chart is not starting from zero, so therefore there is a distortion in the data, and so we are actually showing a difference across the, the two values, which is not, uh, uh, which has a magnitude higher than what we really want to show. Now, one of the uh, issues in this case is that, uh, um, Yes, it's true, the problem, one of the problems is that in this particular case, the bar, the bar chart doesn't start from zero. However, uh, the problem is much, much bigger, and there's a very nice video uh, from Vox, uh, which, uh, which I encourage you to, to look for, which shows what the real problem is with this chart. And what the pro real problem with, with this chart is that it's missing the context. So the context is actually much bigger, and uh, in, in, the, in the overall uh, uh, look at tax rate in the US, this is just a drop in the ocean. So uh, what, is very what's very in what is, is very interesting in this type of visual representation and why it links to graphical integrity is that uh, what is important is to, to, to be truthful on the context of our data. So what is that, uh, um, what, is, what is our objective, objective what, but what is also the entire, the entire uh, 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 
domain of the data, what, what, is the, what is the entirety of the problem. So in this case, for example, maybe we don't need the full, uh, the full uh, history of rate uh, in the United States. We, may, we, we only need a comparison across a different, um, different presidency. But still, uh, the, what is important is to, is to understand, is to look at the variations within a context, not just a single, a single item, to, uh, to, in, to, to, to push a very specific, uh, 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 and, uh, to, to push our own personal, uh, personal agendas in a way, or just something that is not necessarily um, consistent uh, with what you are asking the, the the data to, to show and, the, and the, the, the consumer of this data to be able to interpret. So we are not putting them in, in a position to be able to interpret. Now, uh, why, why I mentioned that the only problem was not that the, the, the bar chart wasn't starting from zero? Because sometimes you just can't start from zero. We have data sets where the variations are so little that we can't have our chart to start from zero. Or we, it just is not just meaningful. Let's, let's think, for example, if you're if you're considering at uh, data sets of human temperature, our uh, human temperature, we want to start, our zero base is the temperature of, uh, of, of, a, of a living body. If we start using zero temperature, it has no meaning. And in other context, zero is something different. If we think at meteorological data, then for them, the, z the zero point is not what we think at, uh, is the zero of an axis. And this is just a, a simple example. This is a representation of the same exact same data according to two, two different, completely different scale. If we start from zero, then we don't see the variation. It's also true that if we don't start from zero, then the variation gets a kind of distortion. So we, we, we show an effect that maybe in the, in the, the overall data set doesn't really have, it's not, it's not as meaningful, it's not as, uh, as, uh, as relevant. So what is the, the way out of it? Well, the, to, be, to be fair, the only way is just to, to, mention, to, to highlight the fact that our data are not starting from zero. And why is it important? This is important because from a cognitive point of view as human being, we all, when we look at a chart, and we, if, we want, if we need to estimate um, um, an interval, if we want to estimate a quantity, we always assume that we are starting from zero. So this is just to be kind to ourselves as human being because we have certain way that we, we do, we know, with which we approach uh, things and especially the way we, we, we interpret what we see. So there are lots of examples of uh, loss of, of integrity in, uh, in data charts. Uh, um, the, the web is, is full of them. Sometimes they're just honest mistakes. Sometimes it's, uh, it's, it's, it's not something that is, uh, that is done on purpose. Sometimes it's, it's less honest. The truth is uh, the graph itself is not, uh, is not, it does, doesn't lie by itself. We are the, we are the maker of the graph. Now, the second point that I've I wanted to, so graphical integrity is, is actually very important, it, it, it's a very, very important uh, principle that I, st I always enforce when I teach my students. This is because uh, um, if, if we start lying with our charts, uh, then we, we lose credibility and integrity, credibility and reputation are, are, are qualities that are very, very difficult to gain back once, once, uh, once we lose them. The second one is uh, uh, simplicity. Now, simplicity is interesting because it's a way of uh, trying to make our to, to make a chart uh, uh, informative, expressive, but without throwing bucket of information to our uh, to our users. And it's not always uh, it's not always simple to use to to avoid this perception of overload. There are some uh, some some guidelines that uh, that can help us out. Uh, on this particular one, I just wanted to, 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 to quote a great designer, Coco Chanel, she always said that less is more. And this is actually true even when we, when we, try, when we, we try to convey our, uh, to, to, to convert our data into vision information. So one of the, um, the most interesting uh, uh, principles that have been, let's say, summarized in the, in the past 50 years is the idea of the data ink ratio. This is a concept from Edward Tafti, and his idea is, so if, if you consider your estate, the state which is your monitor, if we think about it in terms of pixels, so we want to maximize the number of pixels used to convey data, used to convey information, and minimize the number of pixels that are used simply for uh, the chart itself, so just for an aesthetic purpose. 
So what we want to maximize is really this relationship. So to have more as as more data ink, so more pixels for uh, to dedicated towards our data and less towards other uh, other uh, trimmings that are in our visualization. So one of the the, the first thing that is really easy to uh, to to get rid of is um, is anything which is uh, which is a three dimensional effect on any on any fancy effects. So uh, I want just to to to, to, to Kind of uh, break an arrow in favor of uh, of uh, some of the some of the more aesthetic uh, and fancy elements of visualization. So it depends what it also what is our aim. So if our aim is to grab people's attention, then sometimes this type of um, this type of extra elements have a purpose. So it's not just a problem. Let's not use it at all. It depends on our objective. But if the objective is to uh, to to look to uh, investigate the data, to explore the data, to communi com clearly communicate communicate a message, then we can start reducing some of the level of uh, the level of details that we have in our charts. Uh, 3D also has different uh, different issues. Uh, uh, there is an inevitable distortion uh, due to the perspective. If we have a lot of charts, then there is also occlusion. So if we if we are doing that exploration, it can create some serious some ser some serious tr trouble. Unless is and, in, and if we want to use 3D, then we really want to have also interaction to be able to to move around and compensate for this type of uh, of limitations. Now, so how can we simply uh, convert, uh, simplify this type of chart? Well, just by removing 3D and moving to, to, a, to a standard 2D, uh, 2D um, representation, you already ga gain uh, um, more clarity in the overall organization. However, 2D is not the only element, it's not the only, um, it's not the only, moving from 3D to 2D is not the only um, tool that we can use to improve our visualizations. Also, two -dimensional, a two-dimensional representation can be cleaned quite uh, nicely. If we take the simpler, the simpler case of a bar chart, for example, grids, often grids are not really, are, are, are an overkill. They are not really needed to understand, to really understand elements uh, in our charts. Uh, Oftentimes, we, we can also remove lines themselves, and this is because the, um, our brain is really is really good at connecting dots, connecting the lines. So we even with simple with simple uh, uh, tags along our axis, we are we are fine. Background background can is also another another element that can be considered to be removed. Again, it depends also on the cost context. Sometimes we need uh, we need backgrounds. Then uh, uh, double the repetition of the axis is not always ne necessary. We can also reduce. Uh, and eliminate uh, frames, uh, and then there are. So this is roughly probably how most of our basic charts uh, may look like, and they're still effective. So the eliminate the um, removal of all those features uh, is not uh, is not reducing the. Is, it, it doesn't have uh, impact on how well we can uh, we can uh, encode and decode uh, information as uh, as user of this particular of this particular type of, of graph. There are two more steps uh, uh, which have been validated with user studies, but again, they depend on probably on, uh, on personal flavor. And we, there are two more steps that were suggested. And the first one was to remove the axis completely. Now, this is quite interesting because um, removing axis completely seems to kind of <coughs> remove the context. As I mentioned before, I mentioned the word validation. So uh, the, there have been, um, formal and, and, and structured uses, uh, empirical studies that has actually proven that there is no, no real uh, effect on uh, the accuracy. Uh, for example, in value estimation and other primary tasks by removing the axis. Um, one of the things which, uh, which we, you would notice is that, however, even if we are removing the axis, we are still giving a sort of guide, visual guide uh, on each of the bars. So what is happening here, as I mentioned before, is that our brain is really good at connecting lines. So in consciously, we are actually we still see the the, the, the tick as being as, as crossing the entire the entire uh, uh, graph. And then there is one extra step that uh, literature suggests that can also be done, and this is also to remove the tick. Again, the, the, the small tick in the in the axis. Now uh, this is um, this is uh, a, a 
this is uh, something that has been proven to be equally effective. There are, however, certain cases where things may get a bit confused. So this is why we also need to understand what is, uh, what is the, 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 the context of and our message. And this is because if we have uh, charts in, in this, which have these styles, and if we have multiple charts, one to each other, not one next to each, to each other, then um, uh, this type of, this type of uh, um, simplification can uh, have a, uh, can trigger an effect by which we assume, but which we assume that all axes have actually the same uh, the same uh, point of reference. So it can it can it can in, in introduce uh, uh, an error element. So perhaps it's w it works for an individual chart, maybe two on the long run. It can actually introduce some error in the way we perceive. Um, we, we perceive the overall. But this is just to give you an idea of starting from a chart, how, um, what type of, of reasoning we can, uh, we can apply in thinking, okay, is this, uh, is this feature, is this, is this f uh, element in my graph really essential or can it be, can it be removed uh, to gain some, some state space and to gain that particular representation maybe to be used for something else. And this is something we will, I'm going to, to move on uh, shortly when we will, when we will be talking about uh, visual channels and, and encoding. Now, uh, the other two, um, the other two um, interesting principles are to you how to use the, um, to use the uh, right display and to use, uh, to use the right encoding. Now, uh, what do I mean with display? What, with a display, I mean the way we organize the data, so the, the type of chart that we choose. It can be uh, more um, standard or, or, or more sophisticated. And the right encoding is, is how, what, how do we, what kind of um, attributes we, what, what kind of visual attributes we want to choose to represent the, the attributes in our value. Now, uh, the choice of both, of the display and encoding, and this is why I wanted to, I, I kind of clustered them together, is uh, extremely, extremely dependent on the type of data that we have and the type of tasks that we want to, um, to perform. So um, different type of organization, and different type of representation are more or less effective for different type of data and tasks. When I'm in this context, for me, effectiveness oftentimes is performance. Performance is uh, in, uh, in achieving a specific task. So this can be accuracy, this can be, this can be speed, but it's always something that can, uh, that can be measured. It's something that, has, uh, that, 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 that is quantifiable. Now, uh, the visual, this is, uh, these kind of choices are non-trivial, and this is because the visualization design space is actually quite vast. The good news is that we have at the back uh, um, more than 50 years of research, which has provided us with a lot of guidelines. Guidelines as uh, principles that can be used and verified uh, to help us out in achieving our, uh, in achieving our goals. So this is an example of a characterization of each individual chart based on, uh, the, on the core task, analytical tasks that normally are performed. So what we can see in here is that uh, we know that if, for example, if, if you want to look at, uh, at um, compa comparing value, then uh, the, the the, the, best, the best options are definitely bar charts, uh, line charts, and this depends also on the type of data that we have. If it is discrete, then we then definitely want to go for, for a discrete representation. If we, want, if we have continuous data, then we want to favor a continuous type of representation. So temporal continuity, if we use a line, automatically our brain assumes that there is some continuity uh, between the data. So this is why, um, while the two can be used together, sometimes we need to, we need to, to make, uh, to, to make, it's not that easy to, to, um, to swap across, across different layout. For distribution, we, we have a scatter plot, we have histograms, and again, we have also, um, you can also have linear histograms uh, for, to look at relationship, uh, scatter plots, and so on and so forth. So we, we actually have uh, quite a nice, uh, nice way of, uh, of, um, of, of uh, um, deci deciding 
and of choosing the most appropriate uh, uh, visual, the, the most appropriate, appropriate uh, special organization of our data. Uh, when, it, when, it, when it comes to, uh, compo to comparisons and, and also uh, proportions, um, when we want to, if we want to estimate proportions, then we have tons of other type of, of, of visual encoding. We have uh, the classic pie chart, then we have stacked, stacked uh, um, graphs, graphical representations, like stacked bar chart, stacked la uh, area chart, uh, and, um, and each, each, one, each one of which uh, provide the same, uh, the same uh, advantages as this uh, normal counterpart. Plus, given the, the, the fact that we have uh, a stacking option, it also supports uh, uh, comparison. Now, as I mentioned before, um, it's very important to understand the type of data that we have. Uh, this is, uh, this is um, a study that was, um, so all of, these, all of these classifications, again, as I mentioned before, they have all been uh, scientifically uh, validated. And this is something that gives us some confidence and, uh, and uh, um, more, and provides more strength to, these, uh, to, to, to the guidelines that, uh, that are provided in literature. As I mentioned before, so the, the user of bar chart versus line chart, sometimes um, you would be surprised by more often than not that the two are, are used uh, uh, interchangeably. Um, this is actually, um, this, this can cause, it cause issues because we, we do know that uh, the moment we see that the, the, the line is automatically interpreted as continuity. However, the two are much, much are very powerful if they are if they, were, they are used together. And this is because with the line with the line chart we get this kind of temporal continuity if we have continuous data. But sometimes our continuous data can also be interpreted as being discrete. For example, this happen, this happen often in uh, in the financial um, domain. So in finance, we may have uh, the, the we have the we have a trend. We have a we have a distribution over time of data, but we also have uh, individual um, values, uh, in, in values at point in times. And so these values at point in times, for example, can be a you know, volume of a, of a specific uh, stock, uh, uh, sale of stock, uh, or other type of, uh, of interesting information. And in that case, it is, it is very, it is uh, quite, uh, uh, straightforward to be able to link both the point in time and, uh, and, the, and the actual more quantitative and discrete uh, information. Now, uh, I wish I could, I could spend more time on this, but unfortunately, um, I don't have much time and I have quite a lot of uh, still um, uh, to go through. So just trying to just to speed it up a bit, uh, we'll move on to the, to, the LM, the, to the part which is one of the more challenging, but actually one of the more widely studied, and this is the choice of encoding. Now, when we talk about encoding, we talk about something that is, uh, that is referred to in literature as also as a visual variable. So visual variables are a simple, um, are element as simple as uh, the shape of, uh, of an element, the color, the orientations, and then they become also a bit more, more, uh, uh, more sophisticated. Um, the good thing is that, again, uh, there have been um, a, lot of, a lot of research uh, in, um, in this area, and in particular, a, a lot of research looking at what is the uh, effectiveness of each uh, of different visual encoding from a perceptual point of view. Now, just to bring uh, the point home and show you how, how um, um, relevant this is, I want to try and play a quicker game with you. So um, I want you to look at the at a graph, and I, want you to, and I want to ask you a very simple question. How, how much longer is uh, uh, B compared to A? Four times, correct. This is four. Now, how much steeper? Three. Four again. <laughs> now, it, this is this is tricky. This is cheating because I'm not giving you the. I'm not giving what is. We are, we are missing the origin. You're missing not only the origin, you're also missing the system of reference. So that makes things really tricky. Now get ready for the next one. How much larger is B from A? <laughs> <laughs> Samantha says four. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
I wonder, what did you do at kindergarten? It's 10. <laughs> I just thought you were going with a pattern. I know, that's how I tricked you. <laughs> it's actually 10 in terms of, um, so uh, the radius, the radius is 10 times, uh, it is 10, 10 times bigger. And so the, the trick on this one, when I show it to my students, I say, no, you're lying. If we, if we, if we measure it on the, on the screen, it's not true. And actually, this is because the, there is a bit of this distortion when we project. But I gave them the, the original PowerPoint. And OK, now you, now you, you measure it. And it, it is 10. So they are created to be 110. So, um, so why, why, why do we get it wrong? I mean, why do we get it wrong? Um, and this is because, um, so we, because, because it's very difficult to estimate size. It's actually really, really difficult to, es to estimate size and to estimate areas. So uh, now these things get even a bit, a bit more, uh, more tricky, uh, trickier when we start looking at uh, uh, colors. So how much darker is B from A? The same <laughs> so this is interesting. If I had time to, to talk about color, now visually the illusions are amazing. There are some illusions. The checkerboard illusion is great. No, but in this case, no, because they are separated and they have a white background, so there is no interference. But co color is uh, color is is uh, is fun. So it's actually twice as darker. Now, um, to be honest, uh, at the end of the day, who really cares which one is darker? So it's not it's not really the point of, of making an estimation with color. So this is this is one of the things that is that is important. That. Um, uh, so oftentimes, color is used, uh, or even even uh, even uh, shades of gray. They used to encode quantitative information, and they are given to to the user just to make estimations. And this is this is actually a very tricky. And I can assure you, even by adding um, a color map, things don't get any better. Because if I ask you how much bigger is how much uh, bigger is B compared to A. Come on, Samantha, you know. <laughs> no, I'm I joking. do not know. <laughs> I'm it's four, like before. <laughs> I'm sorry. So um, it's four. But this is, uh, this is actually a very difficult uh, cognitive task, because we have to, to look at the two colors, and then go back to the color map, and then go back again. So, um, the, um, so the, 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 the problem here is that uh, um, Color is great for other things. Color is great, for example, for ordering, uh, for, for pop-out pop effect. It's not great when we ask people to make accurate estimation. If we want to make relative estimations or re relative, uh, relative judgments, then it's OK. But we, also, we always have to, 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 to make sure we know what is the, the risk of the error that we are introducing. And uh, uh, as I mentioned before, we do use color a lot, especially in maps. So in maps, uh, um, th think about elections, when, we, when elections are, data are being plotted. So in that case, uh, a bar chart is way more, way more powerful. But if, when we start mapping uh, uh, colors on, on space, then things re really, really, really become tricky. Because we don't only have the color, we also have the area. And then color, color and area are, are play a really big, bad trick on our, on our uh, perceptual system. Things tend to, to look much bigger than, than, they, than they actually are. So um, perce perceptual effectiveness. There have been a lot of studies to understand all the possible ways that uh, the data and attributes in data can be, can be plotted. Now, I really love uh, uh, Stephen Powerlow because what he did, he empirically uh, looked at how we perceive the uh, stimuli. Uh, both uh, per, uh, from a perceptual point of view, visual stimuli, but also a uh, physical stimuli. So um, uh, the way the, uh, to summarize his, his findings, he, 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 he found out that actually we, the way we perceive uh, length is linear, we underestimate volume, volume, we underestimate loudness, and we overestimate electric shock, and we overestimate heaviness. This was before the 50s, when they could do, in psychology, they could do any type of, uh, of user studies. They were just shocking people and see how they, how they would perceive. So, is, so we have a magnitude of a stimuli, the, 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 the lowest gender is an, an exponent, but I mean, I'm, I'm just going, if, if you are interested in, in reading about, about Stephen Power's experiment, it is, it is a very nice read. 
So he basically created this psychophysical uh, power law, which was picked up later on by another, um, another uh, um, uh, great uh, founder of the organization, which, which is uh, Jacques Bertin. Jacques Bertin was a cartographer. And uh, what he did was that he provided one of the, the, the first formalization on how, to, how to, to map the effectiveness of what he called vi our visual variables. He provided a, a categorization, he split uh, uh, visual elements into marks and channels. Now, marks are considered as the basic unit, so the point, line, line areas that really, um, any element which is, uh, which is which which, he, which has uh, uh, dimensional change. And then he looked at channels uh, uh, as uh, all, the, all, those, all the elements that could, be ch could, could change the appearance of a mark. And these are position in space, size, shape, value, uh, color, orientation, and texture. So um, for value, we intended to change it from light to dark. For color, we, we, we refer to the exact hue. And what he did is he classified the effectiveness of each, of each, of each single channel uh, with respect to, uh, to, to, to tasks and type of data. So he looked at ordinary and quantitative uh, uh, data, and he also looked at tasks such as uh, looking at differences and similarities. Now, the, the body of work of, of Bertin is, is much bigger than, uh, than what I'm showing uh, right now. He also was a cartographer, which meant he worked on, uh, on, on, a, on a 2D plane, on paper. Um, so he didn't really look at elements, for example, like volume or, or, the, or motion. And this was only much later on, uh, that was something that was, uh, that was investigated by other people, in particular but, uh, by McKinley, which extended the number of, of, of variables. To, to the ones of the domain of the visual variables, so the ones that are also possible on, uh, on a computer monitor. So just to give a, a quick highlight, uh, um, he, what, he, what Bertin found was definitely that, well, you, we can also see in here that position on the two-dimensional plane is one of the most powerful visual channel. Then he also, um, uh, size is uh, is a is a really is a is a very um, powerful uh, visual channel to use for to communicate quantitative information. Um, for example, the value is um, is actually a much powerful than color to if we want to encode order. Um, and then color orientation and shape fu fu function really, really, really well when we want to create uh, um, association with grouping. And this is, this, we all know when we need to, to look at uh, clustering, cluster for example, then uh, yes, we know that uh, the color and the shapes are one of the, 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 the best channel to convey uh, this kind of information related to grouping. So I probably need to speed up because I'm almost uh, towards the end of my time. But as I mentioned before, there have been uh, other, other type of, uh, of classification, other type of, evalu of evaluations. Cleveland and McGill uh, created um, a, a ranking of all, the, of all the different visual channels and also different, uh, different type of charts for some primary tasks like X estimation. Then there are other, uh, this is all seminal work really that, it, that, that is valid now, still, that is still valid, valid nowadays. Then there are other ways of organizing the, the, the channels as well based more on, on, percep on, on pure perception theory. Uh, and this is organized the channel by, as in terms of identity and magnitude channels. So identity and magnitude channel are, is, uh, is a way of organizing, uh, um, so, so the, the, there, is a, there is a school of thought by which uh, perception is, the, the way our brain works is to, to split, um, to split the, the, the similar we, we receive into identity channels and magnitude channels. Identity channels uh, provide uh, information about uh, what, uh, who, and where something was, magnitude channel give us uh, uh, an idea of, uh, of quantity of how much. And again, there are other, uh, other, uh, other way of organizing, of, of grouping this, uh, the, um, the visual channels uh, according to different uh, variables and according to different criteria. One of the things which is interesting is that no matter what, uh, they are, uh, they, they, 
they were able to, to prove most of also Bertin's, uh, Bertin's uh, uh, findings, and in particular, what is always uh, at the top is, uh, is position, position on both on uh, an un aligned and unaligned scale. So position is a really, really powerful channel in general. So uh, the takeaway message when we, ha when we look at these guidelines is that uh, no matter the scale, always try to use the highest possible encoding that is available for your particular type of data, your particular type of, of, uh, of tasks. Um, of one thing to remember is that once we use a channel, for a visual channel for something, then it can't be used for something else, otherwise we have, we have interference. So um, the, the, in, a, in a way, we have a discrete domain in terms of visual channels, where we have a very large domain in terms of data that we want to, to visualize. And this is where tricks like aggregations or multi-resolution or, or semantic zooming coming into play to, to, to help us uh, optimize uh, our encodings. Now, uh, so far I've only mentioned accuracy. Actually, there are mm, other, other interesting, um, interesting features of uh, visual channels that are interesting to look at. The first one is discriminability, or, which is how many different values we can perceive of, 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 of the same visual channel. The, the, most, uh, the simplest way of, of talking about it is, is colors. So there, are, there is only a certain amount of color that we can really, that we can really uh, distinguish at the same time. So we need to look also for trade-offs. And sometimes you can trade color with space. And this is the effectiveness of visualization, like for example, small multiple. We can just unpack our visualization into, 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 smaller, uh, into smaller graphs. And uh, there are some sophisticated type of visualization which uh, even if they look a bit more complex, in time they, they, they still outperform them. The, the, the single idea, the idea of visualizing everything in a single space. So uh, then there is also separa separa separability. So sometimes uh, uh, channels can interfere between, uh, between each other. Um, so there are some, some that are uh, fully separable, for example, color, color and, uh, and position. Uh, others tend to interfere, for example, uh, size and color tend to interfere. So the color tend to, to give a different, tend, tend to make uh, makes things appear different than, they were actually, than, than what actually they actually are. Width and height, uh, width and height are actually tricky because when the moment we start playing with the shape, our brain starts to group things by shape and not by, by, by other means. So it can create some false grouping. And then there are some color scale where things are, are where it's very, very difficult to make any sort, to distinguish elements. And one of the trickiest one is the red-green uh, color scale. So uh, this is just the same, exactly the same, the, the, the same one, the same example, but uh, looked at as a continuum. Uh, then we have a pop-out effect, which is the, the leveraging of pre-attentive processing. Uh, how much the I'm already out of? Okay, I need to. So in, in pre-attentive features, there are just features that uh, can guide our, uh, our attention, and they are really power powerful uh, in the context of visual search. Pre-attentive features is something that cannot, as a feature that cannot be decomposed into anything which is simpler. So um, there, are, there are some channels that are really, there are cat cat categorization of pre-attentive features that can tell us how powerful they are to, for example, spot the outlier. Again, pre-attentive features are extremely context-dependent, so they, the, the, the categorization that are available are, again, once more guidelines. Then the last one, I'm, 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 not, I'm not stopping on this one, is, gru is grouping. Gru grouping follows the gestalt, uh, gestalt uh, principles, so it's something that perhaps some of you have already, have already encountered. Uh, grouping, as I mentioned before, when we start playing with shapes, then, we, then our brain starts actually clustering elements based on shapes. There are some, some channels that are more powerful. So against our principles, we have similarity, proximity, connection, continuity, closure, figure, ground, and common fate. And what they tell us is that when uh, certain, so for example, similarity, things that look alike uh, to each other tend to be grouped together. Things that are close by tend to be, tend to be grouped together. One of the really powerful uh, um, principles in grouping is uh, anything which is connections. And connection and enclosure are extremely powerful. Something that is connected, our brain very hardly is, 
it, it just can't disconnect it. And I'll give an example. So on the left side, we would perceive a scatter plot. On the right side, we, we perceive uh, um, a line. So the fact of adding a connection already imposed on, on an organization on point in space that we just can't, can't decouple anymore. And this is really interesting yeah, in, in, uh, in context, uh, uh, for example, for when we want to create, to create clusters. So we can play on proximity, we can play on similarity, we can play on enclosure. <coughs> and this is a way of playing with different visual channels, but try not to, in, in, as I mentioned before, the domain of visual channel is restricted. So sometimes if we use something, we can't use it for something else. So uh, in that case, then we need to find alternatives to be able to still, uh, to still obtain, uh, achieve our objective. Then there is one which is actually common fate. Unfortunately, I, there was a really nice, um, this is, uh, well, I'll, I'll give the slides. So this is a very nice example. I, I suggest you to, to look online. And basically, uh, the moment we see this, this set of point as being a skeleton moving, uh, then from that point of view, point, point in time, then it's very difficult to go back. And just by changing the, the way the, the points are being projected, we have different, um, different uh, effect. And this is because this is related to motion. Things that move together tend to be uh, associated to be as belonging to the same uh, to the same body. So um, I need to really yeah. go. So I'm just uh, I'm just go yeah I'm just going uh, to the to the to, to the last one. So um, there are principles and guidelines that are provided. Uh, they uh, ha will help us. In w uh, one of the interesting things is to look at that by s simply changing. Uh, different uh, the way we, the way we lay out our data, the display that we choose, the type of, of color that we choose, then the message that we convey can be much different. Uh, however, uh, all the guidelines that are being provided are guidelines. They are not law or rules set in stone. Uh, there, and there is no hard and fast rule. Uh, what is uh, we, we need to we always always consider our context and use the guidelines as in, in terms of guidance. They, don't, they, don't, they are not something that needs to stop us. And in a way, uh, visualization is, 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 is not a simple, uh, to design as an effective visualization is not a, uh, a straightforward task. And also not in substitute evaluation. So in, if undecided, especially for novel visual encoding, always, uh, always test your hypothesis on, on empirical studies. And these are just um, some resources that maybe worth having a look, and that's it.